Do you think he would like you? That was the question that stopped me in my tracks. That is the question that is addressed to us all. Do you think he would like you? The question comes from a recent documentary about Stephen Sondheim's 1981 Broadway flop, Merrily We Roll Along. The film explores the musical's creation, failure, and the subsequent lives of the younger than usual Broadway cast. At one point in the movie, one of the now grown actors is watching an interview he gave 37 years ago, right before the musical previewed. He wells up with emotion as he sees and hears his 22-year-old self. He says, it's good not to be embarrassed by him, you know? I was afraid I'd be embarrassed by him. Do you like him? The cameraman asks. He's okay, the actor replies. Do you think he would like you? And this question seems to hit hard. There is a long pause as he weighs an honest answer. It's a haunting question, but an important one, an important one in this season of self-reflection. There are many benchmarks we could use to take stock of our lives on Yom Kippur, but this question is certainly one marker. Do you think your younger self would like you? Is there any greater existential distress than the idea that we might be confronted with our young, hopeful, bright-eyed self? That he or she might look at us, hear what we've done, see who we've become, and feel disappointed, or even worse, regard us with disdain. Do you think your younger self would like you? Who doesn't want to be able to say, yes, yes, of course, my 18-year-old self or my 7-year-old self would like me? So how do we ensure that we could answer that question unquestioningly in the affirmative? To live in such a way that we could say, he or she might not recognize me, might be surprised by what has happened in my life, by what choices I've made and what hurdles I've faced, but would like me, would be proud of the life I've lived. We might be tempted to say at first that the answer lies in fulfilling the dreams of our youth. However, achievements need not, and perhaps often don't, lead to lasting happiness. And youthful dreams are rarely prudent or worthy. The documentaries that are called the Up series make this point clear. In 1964, documentarians gathered seven-year-olds from all around Britain and interviewed them. They followed up with the same group every subsequent seven years. Those children are now in their 60s. So over the course of a few weeks, or if you're really a dedicated binger like me, in, in one weekend, you can watch their entire lives unfold. And it becomes clear that there is not necessarily a correlation between achieving and happiness. At age seven, most of them want to be astronauts. By 14 and 21, some dream of prestigious universities, grand careers, building homes or families. Some went to those universities, got those jobs, built those homes. Some then failed those universities, lost their jobs, left their marriages. And others who saw a bright future ahead end up homeless, stuck in dead-end work, or alone. None of them are astronauts. But achievements or not, dreams manifest or not, those who are truly happy seem to be able to reflect that in some way their younger selves would say, I like the person I've become. So what is it that allows them to say that? Ideals. Now, being idealistic is often disparaged. When we call an adult idealistic, 
It's typically a euphemism for being naive, but there is a vital difference. As we gain experience, as we learn from mistakes and hardships, we should in time lose our naivete. However, with ideals, the opposite is the case. Difficulties can temper our ideals like a hammer tempers steel. One Jewish commentary explains that the menorah, the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, and the trumpets that were used at the ancient temple, all of these represent Israel's greatest ideals. How do we know this, the commentary asks? Because they're made from hammered silver and gold. Our loftiest ideals are the ones that have been shaped by hard knocks, and instead of becoming misshapen or growing dull, they become more beautiful and more true. Untested ideals are naive, but ideals that we have clung to and allowed hardship to refine, these are the greatest gifts life can offer us. The life of Senator John McCain is a clear example of this. Whatever your opinion of his politics, he lived according to deeply held ideals, ideals which were tested in unimaginable ways. But those trials did not cause his commitment to them to wane. Rather, it was deepened. And as he neared the end of his life, he shared in his statements to us that death was acceptable to him because he felt he'd spent his life in pursuit of ideals that guided. Ideals sprung from a source greater than himself in which he put to use to serve something more than himself. Who amongst us would not seek a similar sense of serenity? The source of those feelings of fulfillment is an idealistic life because ideals instill within us two vital parts of our identity. They instill within us ideology and idealism. Ideology is the belief system that's created by the network of our ideals. It tells us who we are and for what we stand. It allows us to look at situations and discern what our best, highest self would want us to do, even if we don't listen. And as we experience setbacks and triumphs, as we learn more about human nature and about ourselves, we hone our ideology. As it evolves, our ideology helps take our ideals from a place of naivete to a place of experience and wisdom. But ideology alone is not enough to ensure that we are living in a way that would make our younger selves proud. For that, ideology needs its partner, idealism. Idealism is that core part of us that remains optimistic and hopeful that believes that we can and should act upon our ideals. It's that force that propels Charlie Brown to keep trying to kick Lucy's football. It's that force that Bob Dylan had in mind when he penned the lyric hoping that his son might stay forever young. Dylan didn't literally want his son to remain a child. Rather, he wanted his child to grow up and retain his idealism. What does that look like? Dylan's lyrics describe it. May you always do for others. May you always be courageous. Stand upright. May you build a ladder to the stars. May your heart always be joyful. While our ideology can shift, our idealism should remain constant. And yet, typically, we do the opposite. We cling to our beliefs while disappointment leads us to give up any hope that we could actually live by them. And ultimately, this embitters us. We've seen those people. We've all been those people at some point. Those people who traded in idealism for the safety of so-called pragmatism or realism. Those people who grow tired of doing for others because others aren't doing for them in return. Who see courage go unrewarded and no longer stand upright if they can't calculate the clear benefit. Whose joy has turned to cynicism. 
But when we give up on our idealism, we are just a step away from compromising our ideals. We begin down a road at whose end is a person of whom our younger selves would not be proud and of whom we are unlikely to be proud. The trick of life is allowing setbacks and sorrows to refine our ideology while our idealism remains intact. It is a challenge, but it is possible, it is necessary, and it is so very worthwhile. Take one of the subjects from the UP series. At age seven, Bruce had a strong sense of faith and responsibility for those less fortunate than himself. When he grew up, he wanted to be a missionary who could teach people to be good. It's not exactly a personal ideology that's going to carry you through life, but it's the beginning of one. Seven years later, at age 14, Bruce is full of doubts. He said he wouldn't be any good at being a missionary, but he still wants to help people if he could. By 21, he was at Oxford stud studying mathematics, and he no longer really knew what he wanted to do. Bruce seemed completely lost until he mentions that he took some time off to work at a school for children with special needs and had found that incredibly fulfilling. Between 21 and 28, Bruce worked for an insurance company, but he eventually quit. And then he began teaching underserved and predominantly immigrant children in East London. Why? He said he wanted to provide students in public school the same quality of education he received in private schools. Years later, asked as a 42-year-old about his outlook amidst the difficulties of teaching in an underserved area, he said, I'm an optimist. I believe that we can show the way for developing a harmonious, multicultural society. At 49, he left London's East End, worn down by the work, he teaches now at a prestigious private school where he has become the head of the math department at age 56. Bruce's life has not been a straight path, but watching the films, it's clear that from age seven to age 56, Bruce held ideals that guided him. They formed an ideology that we can articulate. He believes his life is about helping others. He believes that all people deserve an equal shot. He believes that his privileged upbringing gives him a responsibility. And we can watch this ideology mature through the films. At first, it was focused on, to use his words, helping civilize others, which is very British. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but as he grew up and eventually encountered those others, his ideology evolves into the creation of a multicultural society. Now, let's be clear. His ideals did not provide him with a life of ease. Bruce looks back and sees moments when holding on to his ideals made life more difficult. Moments when he lost his way, moments when he felt very much alone. And they did not provide him with a life of unmatched material success, but if we asked those younger versions of him, if they like the person that they've become, we have no doubt that they would say yes. And there is an incredible sense of fulfillment and wholeness and meaning to be found in that self-knowledge. And it's, it's not limited simply to a self. It's true of communities and it's true of nations as well. Just as we can use this question on Yom Kippur to take stock of our individual lives, we can also use it to take stock of our national life. And one could say that Election Day is the Yom Kippur of the secular calendar. Stay with me. <laughs> like for Yom Kippur, leading up to an election, our nation has to take stock. We ask ourselves, where have we been? Who are we? And who do we want to be? So in a, in a season when we will vote into office individuals who will serve as the stewards of our national ideals, we might ask ourselves, would they like us? 
those early generations of our nation. Now, of course, America has never been one thing. There have always been diverse voices clamoring to shape our nation's ideals. But even amidst dissent, there is a predominant viewpoint in society about who we are and for what we stand. So in this case, we can look to the words of George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. In his first inaugural address, Jefferson spoke about ideals that formed the bright constellation which guided our steps. These ideals come into focus when we read the speeches of our first three presidents. So, would they like us? Unquestioningly, there is much about which early Americans would be exceedingly proud, exceedingly proud if they encountered us today. But let's ask ourselves, are there ideals that shone brightly in their writing, ideals which have been tested and tempered by time and experience like hammered gold, but which we have allowed to lose their luster? And if so, let's examine them, because as John McCain advised us, we weaken our greatness when we doubt the power of our ideals rather than trust them to be the great forces for change they have always been. One ideal our founders might lift up is to quote from Jefferson and Adams, a jealous care of the right of election by the people. Such care is necessary to ensure that no foreign nation or party should infect the purity of our free and independent elections. A second ideal is what Adams called a love of science and letters and a wish to encourage schools, universities, and every institution for propagating knowledge among all classes of people, because an educated populace is the only means of preserving our Constitution. A third is equality under the law. We are to fashion what our founders called a nation reflective of the truth, that all are created equal, a government which gives to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance. For the minority possess their equal rights, which equal law must protect, and to violate would be oppression. And a fourth ideal I think they might lift up to us is that of national unity. And here, George Washington simply said it best. The name American must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations or political factions. Our citizens, and especially our representatives in government, should be concerned more with the business of state than the game of party politics. These are among the ideals laid down by our founders and our framers. They were not fully achieved by them, they were not fully achieved by our mothers or our fathers. And our ideology around these ideals has evolved. After all, what they meant by equality for all is different from what we envision today. But the responsibility to continue the work to embody these values falls to us now. As John Adams charged us, it is for the young to make themselves masters of what their predecessors have been able to comprehend and accomplish but imperfectly. For this work, we will need our idealism intact. We will need to continue to believe that these ideals, which have guided our steps for generations, are worth pursuing, and that progress is possible. Because ideologies aside, whether it is in our personal life, or whether it's in the life of our nation, we can no longer allow pragmatism to excuse lack of action and lack of vision. We can no longer allow fear, whether it's fear of failure or fear of futility, to stifle our attempts at living in accordance with our ideals. We can no longer allow cynicism to keep us from acting on our deepest held beliefs and convictions. This holiday season calls on us all to reconnect to our idealism. Do you think they would like you? Your seven-year-old self, your 18-year-old self. Do you think they would like us, that generation who dreamed up this great nation? May we always 
be able to answer those questions yes. And may we always remember and help remind others that at the heart of Yom Kippur is the conviction that we have never gone too far down any road that we might not return to our best selves. We can still recommit to our ideals no matter where along life's road we may have cast them aside. And we can still revisit and refine our ideology no matter how entrenched it has become. And we can still rekindle our idealism no matter how accustomed we've grown to the darkness. In the year ahead, in every new year, in every new beginning, may we stay forever young. And may you stay forever young. ויגשים משאלתך שתעשה בשביל אחר והוא למענך שתיגע בכל כוכב ותטפס על כל שלב שתישאר צעיר לנצח שתגדל להיות צודק שתדע לראות האור ולמצוא את האמת בתוך החושך הגדול שתמיד תהיה חזק את תשחק את המשחק שתישאר צעיר לנצח לילה 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 לילה